Hello, Professor Polytoad here, and let's talk about geology. So today's video is a bit of a mix, as I have two topics I want to discuss in today's video. Originally, I wanted to talk about the Pokemon carving and how it is geologically. In the Diancie movies, there are four forms of carving, and I wanted to use them to talk about diamonds, kimberlites, and kimberlite pipes. Sorry, not those diamonds. But now, it's after December 14th, 2023, and the release of the second part of the Scarlet and Violet DLC, The Hidden Treasure of Area Zero. While I was playing through the new Under Depths of Area Zero, I was mesmerized by the huge cave system and the crystals within. My geology brain just loved it, and I knew when I entered here, this would be my new favorite part of the DLC. But then I came across an old friend, Carbink. I was surprised, to be honest. I thought there would be some Paradox Pokemon or something, but just Carbink and Glamora. But it made me think of the carving video that I had been putting off for so long. And then I began to look at the cave again, and I thought to myself, this looks awfully familiar. So now I have two parts to this video, carving and how it do, and area zero, and how we can get such large crystal columns. But first, I want to talk about carving. Carving gets its name from the element carbon, and is a gray-white rock and fairy Pokemon introduced in the sixth generation X and Y. I always thought this little gray guy looks like a rabbit, but this little gray rock is just a chunk of diamond. Chemically, diamonds are just the element carbon and can be stable under conditions of high pressure and temperature around 120 kilometers below the Earth's surface. There is no chemical difference between diamonds and the graphite found in your average pencil, but it's the high pressure and temperatures that can form carbon into the necessary cage-like arrangement of atoms as opposed to the flat arrangement of carbon atoms that is graphite. Now, you don't have to take my word for that either, but you can take the X Pokedex entry, which states, Born from temperatures and pressures deep underground, it fires beams from the stone in its head. So, where can we find diamonds? It's completely impossible for us to mine deep enough to reach the depths that diamonds are stable at, so where can we find them? That's where we need to look for the rock kimberlite and the kimberlite pipe structures. These potassic, magnesium, and carbonate-rich alkaline rocks are the usual suspects to hosting diamonds and are found in volcanic pipes known as kimberlite pipes. These volcanoes produce mantle-derived melts that are sourced from the deep conditions of diamond formation and rise to the surface very rapidly, causing explosive volcanic eruptions at the surface. These kimberlite pipes are the remnants of these rapidly moving melts and explosive nature of the volcanic eruptions due to the brecciated fragments usually found within. Diamonds form deep within the Earth's mantle and will take a ride on these rapidly ascending melts to reach shallower depths. If diamonds get to surface slowly, the crystal structure will destabilize because of the slow lowering of the temperature and pressure and revert into graphite. It's the rapid ascension of the diamonds that doesn't allow time for the diamonds to revert and remain as is close to the surface within these kimberlite pipes. And this is what a kimberlite pipe looks like, very carrot shaped in my opinion. There are three main facies that are distinct in kimberlite pipes, and these are the hypabyssal facies, the lowest of the three, the diatreme facies, where most of the diamonds are found, and the crater facies, the explosive part of the volcanic pipe. Now, let's talk carving. Geologically, the design of carving is rather simple showing chunks of diamond found within a fine-grained gray rock, which can also be seen with the four other forms of carving. So how do diamonds explain the different forms of carving? Diamonds are much more complex than being made of just carbon, and there are two main types of diamonds among many. P-type diamonds are the typical diamonds found in kimberlite pipes, and they are deep mantle sourced and have inclusions of olivine, magnesium-rich garnet, and spinel within the crystal matrix, and can be found in these areas. E-type diamonds are a bit different, as they are a product of high pressure and temperature in subduction zones reaching low depths, where the carbon is sourced from the ocean floor sediments moving down. Other types of diamonds include pink diamonds, like the one found in Diancy, which is theorized to get its color from later plastic deformation of the environment the diamonds are sourced from. As well, there are blue diamonds, like the world-famous Hope Diamond, which gets its color from the presence of boron within the crystal matrix. Essentially, what differs diamonds from each other are the inclusions found within from the environments of formation for that diamond. Now, let's get back to carving. It's difficult to know what inclusions are found within the diamonds on carving without a close microscopic look at the crystals within. However, looking at carving's eyes, 
they are blue. Since carbon is just a chunk of diamond, we can assume that the blue eyes are blue diamonds, which gets its color from the element boron within the crystal matrix. Boron-rich diamonds are deep mantle source, which also lets us give the assumption that the rest of the diamonds in carbon are p-type diamonds, other deep mantle source diamonds found in kimberlites. The other forms of carbon most likely contain the same source of diamonds, but contain inclusions of different minerals like madurite, wadsleyite, or ringwardite, which are higher pressure varieties of garnet and olivine. And so what we have here is our kimberlite rock, otherwise carbon. So this core came from uh, Lake Temiskaming, which is in northern Ontario. Otherwise, it's uh, it's known as the, the I'm pretty sure it's Buck kimberlite. It's a B-U-C-K-E kimberlite, but it's super, super cool. And we'll uh, we'll get a close-up of this uh, of this guy. Yeah, so here we got a close-up of our uh, kimberlite. Uh, as you can see, I got half of it wet, so you make it a little bit easier to see. But right here, we've got our super, super brecciated, super fragmented rocks in our uh, fine-grained gray carbonate rock matrix. As you can see, there's a large fragment right there little tiny ones right here. When it said a rock is brecciated, it means that it's super fragmented. And as you can see in this guy, oh, as you can see in this guy, super, super, super fragmented, super, super brecciated. It just means there's a lot of fragments within this rock. So, uh, so these fragments are gonna contain minerals of like olivine or spinel or garnet. Also diamonds. I've been, uh, I've been looking at this guy, couldn't tell you exactly if there were diamonds in here, but this is our, this is our kimberlite. And this brings us to Area Zero and the new Under Depths introduced in the second half of the Scarlet and Violet DLC, The Hidden Treasures of Area Zero. How can we tie Carbink to this new area? Does it make sense that Carbink is found here? Yes and no. Let me explain. The tie between Area Zero and Carbink is the carbonate rock type, where Carbink is the magnesium-rich carbonate rock that is mantle sourced and occurs in explosive volcanic eruptions, and Area Zero is most likely a karst. Karsts are a form of carbonate topography that form from the dissolving of soluble carbonate rocks from the movement of underground water. This dissolving of carbonate rock produces expansive caves along the path the water takes, and occasionally produces sinkholes as the cave systems reach the surface. This is totally what is happening in Area Zero, considering the amount of surface waterfalls converging into a deep central hole and pooling right at the bottom. Hello everybody! Welcome to Manitoulin Island, the largest freshwater island on planet Earth. So Manitoulin Island began to form during the late Ordovician period up to the early Silurian period. And it started to grow as a carbonate reef on the shallow sea floor around 450 to 430 million years ago. And so right behind me, we've got the beautiful Bridal Veil Falls, one of the prettiest things to come visit when you come to Manitoulin Island. So what we got, the rock right here, is our late Ordovician um, Georgian Bay formation. This is one of our oldest rock types on the, uh, on the island itself, and we've got such a beautiful, beautiful waterfall. So you may be asking yourself, why did I take you to this uh, beautiful, beautiful waterfall when, when talking about Area Zero? Well, I said Area Zero might be a karst, so what's going on here is very similar chemistry as to how our deep sinkhole of a karst formed. This is another example of karst formation, what's going on right here. And so, based on this chemical formula, that's right here, we've got water that's coming down as precipitation. And as it's falling through the sky, falling as rain, it's picking up CO2 and it, the, the water is bonding with that CO2 to form carbonic acid. And so that carbonic acid is flowing with the rest of its water. And so that carbonic acid is flowing with the rest of the water down. And when it comes in contact with our carbonate or our CaCO3, what we got right there is our dolomitic limestone. So that's our CaCO3 right there. Once the uh, carbonic acid comes in contact with that material, it releases the calcium ion from the complex and effectively starts to dissolve the rock, which is why you've got such a cave back in there, right? And why I'm able to walk behind the waterfall just like this. So the cool thing about Manitoulin Island is we can actually track the carbonates found on the island maybe five or six hundred kilometers south all the way down to Toronto and into the Niagara Falls area. Super cool. So if this is our carving, 
then what we got going on here is our area zero. This is what we had to work with when Scarlet and Violet originally released. There are large crystals at the bottom of Area Zero, and I chalked them up to just being terrestrialization crystals, which was probably the intention. But now with the release of the second half of the DLC, we can go even deeper into Area Zero, which even furthers the thought that this is a karst from the further pooling of water towards the end of the cave with the tree, and the massive collection of large crystal columns within. The large crystals form as elongated columns, but there are also large collections of local, massive varieties of this crystal meaning there is no distinct shape to them, they're just masses. For analysis, we'll look at the euhedral varieties of these crystals, the ones with the most distinct shapes. They are typically elongated columns of a white to clear crystal with six distinct sides. The most real life culprit of these crystals is the mineral anhydrite. Before I talk about the details of anhydrite, let's look at some real world examples of these caves with large crystal columns. The most famous of these caves is the giant crystal cave in Nica, Mexico, where large columns of gypsum are present in caves found in limestone, a variety of carbonate rock. These large crystals were found in the early 2000s and form completely submerged in water. The submergence of water allows for a constant supply of elements to continuously crystallize gypsum, and being completely submerged allows for larger crystals to form because of the laxer gravity in water. When this cave was discovered in 2000, it was fully submerged in water, and it wasn't until the water was pumped out before the cave could be fully explored. The Paldea region is based on the country Spain, and there happens to be karsts with large gypsum columns there too, albeit smaller gypsum columns. The cave is named, and I'm gonna butcher this, I'm so sorry, Cuevas de Sorbas. Sorbas? Sorbas. Cave of Swords, and is in Almeria, Spain. Other similar gypsum caves can be found in Ukraine and the western Ural mountain range in Russia. But why would I say the crystals in Area Zero is the mineral anhydrite, where the minerals in these real world caves are gypsum? First, looking at the crystal shape of these columns, anhydrite and gypsum both have six sides to their crystal, and looking at these two minerals chemically, we can see the only difference between the two is the presence of water. Gypsum forms with water in its crystal matrix, which is another reason why the giant crystal cave produced such large crystals of gypsum, and the removal of water from the crystal matrix produces the mineral anhydrite. When the giant crystal cave was discovered, it was shortly refilled with water to preserve the large crystal columns, as the reverting of gypsum to anhydrite would destabilize the crystal, and they would fall apart. Anhydrite can be stable if it crystallizes originally as anhydrite, but if water is removed from gypsum, Yes, technically this is now anhydrite, but with an unstable crystal structure. We can infer that this reversion would be occurring within the crystals due to the opening of Area Zero, as it's not flooded. In essence, Area Zero formed from the dissolution of carbonate rock via the movement of water. The water then began to fill Area Zero to a certain point, which is most likely here as crystal growth distinctly stops here. This is a map I drew of Area Zero, and I've broken it into six distinct areas the upper and lower field, the upper and lower cave, the under depths, and the drainage at the bottom. There are cases of crystals growing in the upper and lower field areas of Area Zero, but we can argue that there was a transition zone between a zone of complete ocean water submergence and a zone of progressive ocean water submergence based on the relative sea level of the planet, which probably cycles due to the changing sea level over time. We can typically track the rising and falling of sea level through geologic time in carbonate rock by looking at the peritidal cyclostratigraphic structures within the rock. Because we have crystallization mostly below this transition zone, we can infer this is the lowest point of sea level fall possible. And the minor mineralization above represents the cyclic change of sea level rise and fall over time. Gypsum columns begin to crystallize in the completely submerged area of Area Zero for a long time to be able to form such large crystals. The water then somehow drained, exposing the large gypsum crystals. The exposure to air began to dehydrate the mineral, reverting the columns to anhydrite, and beginning to destabilize the crystal structure. Area Zero deceptively looks like a volcano, considering it's a large circular hollow structure in the middle of an island. But I argue that this is a karst instead. There is the theory that the Area Zero crater was caused by the weapon AZ set off 3,000 years ago because of its crater appearance and close proximity to the Kalos region, as Spain is close to France. Although plausible, I don't think that this is the case because of the crystal sizes in the under depths of Area Zero. In the giant crystal cave, these gypsum crystal columns took over 500,000 years to get to that size. 3,000 years is significantly shorter than 500,000, 
and the crystals in Area 0 are significantly larger than the ones in the giant crystal cave. Thus, I argue that Area 0 is a karst. Since the Paldea region is surrounded by an ocean, the water that flows through Area 0 begins to flow below the water table and flow back into the surrounding ocean, which is why the cave remains open and not flooded. So, is there any real tie between Carb Inc. and Area 0? There isn't much of a connection to be honest, besides their shared ties to Carbonate Rock. But even then, these carbonate rocks form in very different ways. There also aren't any karst diamond hosting deposits on Earth. However, in Africa, specifically in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there are examples of kimberlite pipes that have been destroyed by karst formation, leading to diamonds being found in river systems at surface. So yes, it kind of makes sense that carbon could be found in the under depths of Area Zero. Maybe Area Zero is one of these destroyed kimberlite pipes via karst formation, like what is found in Africa. But considering how rare this really is, it's just the carbonate rock type that ties these two together. To summarize, carbink is a kimberlite, a magnesium-rich carbonate rock that is sourced from deep in the mantle and contains diamonds within, found within these volcanoes called kimberlite pipes. They are typically brecciated or very fragmented due to the explosive nature of the eruptions, and the inclusions within the diamonds can help us determine the depth of formation and the environment of formation for the diamonds within. Area 0 is a karst, which forms in the dissolving of carbonate rock from the movement of water. This is further shown with the large columns of anhydrite present within the cave systems. Now, in all honesty, I think I just want an excuse to talk about carbonate rocks. I have many in my personal collection, such as these guys right here. And this one right behind me is a dolomitic limestone with a, with a coral in it. So I think it's really pretty. Just like that, kind of like a net shape. Super cool. But regardless, thank you for watching to the end of my video. I hope you learned something new about diamonds, karsts, carbonate rocks. But again, thank you very much. Every good video always ends on a sad thought, so here it goes. Since terrestrialization won't reappear in future titles, rip Terrapagos. I think the reversion of gypsum to anhydrite would be the cause of that. Because this reversion would create an unstable anhydrite crystal, these crystals would end up destroying themselves. If the crystals in Area 0 eventually destroy themselves to this reversion, it would be a lore reason as to why terrestrialization doesn't return in future games. I think they even know that this would be the case, as in the DLC, both instances of terrestrialization are caused by, sometimes intentionally, submerged anhydrite or gypsum crystals. Why would the terrarium keep the crystals in a fluid if they didn't want terrestrialization to stop randomly? As it looks like Area Zero isn't going to refill with water anytime soon, Terrapagos is shit out of luck.